Hi there. This is Scholar Minor, a podcast about myth, magic, and occasional miscellany. My name is Ursula. I'm your host and fellow learning enthusiast. Welcome back, everybody. This week, I'm excited to welcome you to Scholar Miner's Greek Myths Part 1. Every handful of episodes, we'll take a look at three myths with an overarching theme. Since Valentine's Day is coming up, our myths this week share the common theme of love, two romantic and one familial, though in true mythological fashion, they do not have happy endings. Love has inspired art, music, war, and it literally alters the chemistry of the human brain. Attraction to another person increases dopamine, a neurochemical our brain produces when we do things that bring us satisfaction and pleasure. Norepinephrine, a neurotransmitter and stress hormone, rises and makes us nervous, excited, and gives us butterflies in our stomachs. Oxytocin, a hormone nicknamed the bonding hormone or the love hormone, is released during pregnancy and skin-to-skin -skin contact between a mother and a baby. Love is inarguably one of the most powerful forces on the planet, and stories of love are found all over the world and in countless mythologies. Though love has existed since the dawn of time, so too has cruelty and inequity. Before we continue, it is important to point out that the Greek gods were known for many things, but respecting consent from sexual partners is not one of them. Please be mindful that there are references in some of these myths to sexual assault. I don't want anyone to be uncomfortable or caught off guard. Tonight, we'll be telling the stories of Orpheus and Eurydice, Apollo and Hyacinthus, and Callisto and Arcas in Scholar Minor's Greek Myths, Part 1. Orpheus with his lute made trees and the mountain tops that freeze bow themselves when he did sing. To his music plants and flowers ever sprung. As sun and showers there had made a lasting spring. Everything that heard him play, even the billows of the sea, hung their heads and then lay by. In sweet music is such art, killing care and grief of heart fall asleep or hearing die. Orpheus was the greatest musician and poet in all the world. No wonder it was in his genes. His mother was Calliope, the beautiful-voiced muse of epic poetry. The god Apollo himself taught Orpheus to play the lyre. While accompanying the expedition of the Argonauts, after encountering a great storm at sea, Orpheus played on his lyre to appease the Samothracian gods. So impressed were the gods that the storm ceased and the skies were cleared. Author Thomas Bullfinch describes Orpheus's musical talents thusly. Not only his fellow mortals, but wild beasts were softened by his strains, and gathering round him laid by their fierceness, and stood entranced with his lay. Nay, the very trees and rocks were sensible to the charm. The former crowded round him, and the latter relaxed somewhat of their hardness, softened by his notes. In Greek mythology, nymphs were beautiful female deities associated with the natural world. Orpheus fell in love with one of these nymphs whose name was Eurydice. They were married in a ceremony attended by the god of marriage himself, Hymenaeus. Hymenaeus's torch was smoking profusely and brought tears to the eyes of the young couple, however, a sinister foreshadowing of what was to come. Shortly after the wedding, Eurydice was accosted while out walking. Some versions of the myth say she encountered a simple shepherd, some say a satyr, a woodland god with the ears and tail of a horse. Either way, as her attacker began to advance, Eurydice ran for her life, but stepped on and was bitten by a venomous serpent during her flight. She was dead. Orpheus's heart was broken. Roman poet Ovid tells us that when Orpheus had mourned sufficiently in the upper air, he bravely went below, lest he should leave the underworld untried. Descending into the underworld and confronting the god of the dead, Hades, and his wife Persephone, Orpheus sang his song of heartbreak and begged for Eurydice to be returned to the land of the living to live out the rest of her natural lifetime, which had been so cruelly cut short. Orpheus's music moved those in the underworld, even those being tormented, to listen and weep. These words, writes Ovid, accompanied by the plucked strings, so moved the bloodless spirits that they wept. 
Tantalus did not seek the receding water, and on his wheel lay Ixion, astounded. The bird let go the liver, and the daughter of Danao were resting on their urns, while you, O Sisyphus, sat on your stone. Then, for the first time ever, overcome by the effects of the song, the Furies wept, nor could Persephone reject his prayer, nor he who rules the underworld deny him. Eurydice emerged from the throng of the newly dead, still limping from her snake bite. Hades agreed that Orpheus could return with his wife to the land of the living with one condition. Orpheus was forbidden from turning to look at her until they had left the underworld. Orpheus led his wife through the darkness in silence. When they were very close to returning to the land of the living and the end of their journey, Orpheus for a moment forgot his promise and looked behind him nervously to assure himself that she was still following behind. She was immediately whisked away. Stretching out their arms to embrace each other, they grasped only the air, describes Bullfinch. Dying now a second time, she yet cannot reproach her husband, for how can she blame his impatience to behold her? Farewell, she said, a last farewell, and was hurried away so fast that the sound hardly reached his ears. Orpheus tried again to find her, but the ferryman to the underworld, Charon, refused him passage back. Bullfinch tells us that Orpheus lingered at the entrance for seven days and seven nights, without sleep and without food, before returning heartbroken to the land of the living. He would never love another woman, to the dismay of many Thracian maidens, who eventually called upon the Menads, female followers of Dionysus, to kill him in retribution for his disinterest. Bullfinch concludes the sad story of Orpheus. The maniacs tore him limb from limb and threw his head and his lyre into the river Hebrus, down which they floated murmuring sad music, to which the shores responded in a plaintive symphony. The muses gathered up the fragments of his body and buried them at Lebethra, where the nightingale is said to sing over his grave more sweetly than in any other part of Greece. His lyre was placed with Jupiter among the stars. If only I were permitted to die or exchange my life for your own, but even though fate's law prevents this, you will be with me always. My lips will never forget you. You will be present in my songs and my music, and a flower will come into being inscribed with my mourning. Later, a legend involving the boldest of heroes will be conjoined to this flower and read in its markings. The hyacinth is a beautiful springtime plant, growing from a bulb planted in autumn into a mass of graceful green spear-like leaves and conical blooms of heavily fragrant star-shaped flowers in purples, whites, pinks, yellows, reds, and blues. Hyacinth was named for Hyacinthus, lover of Apollo, and the subject of our next myth. Apollo was the god of many things, of the sun, of archery, of prophecy, poetry, music, and dance, and others. A widely worshipped god, Apollo's temple at Delphi was occupied by the Pythia, a high priestess who would receive messages directly from Apollo to assist mortals in warding off evil. The son of Zeus, king of the gods, and Leto, Apollo appears as a handsome youth and is often depicted with his bow and arrow or with his lyre. Apollo fell in love with a young Spartan prince named Hyacinthus. Together they would hunt, fish, and mountain climb. Bullfinch tells us that Apollo even neglected for him his lyre and his arrows. Unfortunately for the lovers, another god had his eye on Hyacinthus, god of the west wind, Zephyrus. One afternoon, Apollo and Hyacinthus took part in a friendly match of the discus, a heavy disc made to be thrown long distances, an event still featured in the modern decathlon. Though some versions of the myth claim what followed was simply a horrible accident, Others blame the malevolent interference of Zephyrus. Hyacinthus was struck in the head by the heavy discus and collapsed. Ovid describes the terrible scene. The selfsame pallor now blankets the boy and the god who kneels to embrace him, who gathers the fallen lad and attempts to revive him, who staunches his wound, and who now, by the application of healing herbs, tries to keep his soul from departing without success, 
for the wound defies the god's treatment. Despite all of Apollo's power, he was unable to save Hyacinthus. As when one has broken the stem, laments Bullfinch, of a lily in the garden, it hangs its head and turns its flowers to the earth. So the head of the dying boy, as if too heavy for his neck, fell over on his shoulder. Blaming himself for the death of Hyacinthus, as it had been he, Apollo, who threw the discus that killed him, Apollo declares that he will inscribe a flower with his regret. And so, from the blood-stained ground beneath Hyacinthus, emerged the hyacinth. One after one the stars have risen and set, sparkling upon the hoarfrost of my chain, the bear that prowled all night about the fold of the North Star hath shrunk into his den, scared by the blithesome footsteps of the dawn. Ursa Minor, the little bear, is a constellation of stars containing Polaris, the North Star, the closest bright star to the North Celestial Pole. Its companion constellation is called Ursa Major, or the Great Bear, and is the third largest constellation in the sky. Our story begins with the goddess Artemis, daughter of Zeus and Leto and twin sister of Apollo. She was the goddess of the hunt, wild nature, and of chastity. Callisto was a nymph and one of those huntresses who swore to devote themselves only to the hunt, promising a lifetime of chastity. Ovid tells us that Callisto did not spend her days before the loom, nor in the artful styling of her hair. A modest brooch was her one ornament, and a white headband bound her otherwise neglected tresses. So artlessly adorned, and sometimes with her swift javelin in hand, sometimes a bow, she was Diana's soldier, and no nymph pleased the goddess more than she did. After a long afternoon of hunting, Callisto fell asleep in the forest, using her quiver as a pillow. Unfortunately, Zeus, who has a long history of being thoroughly awful, decided to pursue her. Able to shapeshift, Zeus transformed himself into the image of the goddess Artemis and tricked Callisto into allowing him to approach her. Callisto was raped, and soon she discovered she was with child. Shunned by the other huntresses and indeed by Artemis herself, Callisto gave birth to a son named Arcus. By this point, Zeus's wife, the goddess Hera, had discovered her husband was the father of Arcus. Remember that inequity I mentioned in our introduction? Well, here it is. Instead of holding Zeus accountable for his behavior, keeping in mind this was not an isolated incident, Hera, enraged, transformed Callisto into a bear so that she might never be beautiful again. For 15 years, the terrified Callisto lived as a bear in the forests, how often she would be too terrified to lie down by herself in the deep woods, recounts Ovid, and wandered to the fields near her old home. How often had a baying pack of hounds driven her upward through the steep ravine? How many times the huntress was the hunted? Often she hid herself at the sight of beasts, forgetting that she was a beast herself. One day, the now adolescent Arcus was out hunting in the woods, having inherited Callisto's affinity for wild places, and suddenly he came upon a bear. Unbeknownst to Arcus, that bear was his mother. And when she sees him, writes Ovid, she stands motionless and seems to recognize him as her son. Fearing he knows not what, he flees from her unmoving eyes that fix on him forever, and as she tries to close the gap between them, he turns to thrust his spear into her breast. Just as he was about to strike, Zeus stayed his hand, preventing the unintentional matricide. In an attempt to make amends, he turned Arcus also into a bear, and placed mother and son in the stars where they could exist together, finally untroubled. Hera was even more furious when she discovered that Callisto and Arcus had been given a permanent home together in the stars. In a final gesture of malice, Hera demanded that the gods of the sea, Tethys and Oceanus, deny Callisto and Arcus the ability to ever enter the oceans, which is why the Great and Little Bear constellations move around the northern celestial pole, but never sink below the horizon and the waves.
I hope that you enjoyed our first venture into Greek myths and that they pulled those heartstrings just a little. While tragic, I love mythological stories like these ones because they are where the connection between our ancestors and ourselves feels most tangible. Falling in love, heartbreak, jealousy, and loss are emotions that humans have been grappling with for countless generations, and I find something comforting in that. No matter how your heart aches or sings, others have been right there with you for hundreds, if not thousands of years. That being said, the world of mythology is an awfully frightening one. As wisely observed by our friend Ovid, let others praise ancient times. I am glad I was born in these. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next Wednesday. In the meantime, you can check out www.ursaminorcreations.com for additional content. Scholar Minor is available most places you can find podcasts, references are in the show notes, and if you have a friend, loved one, professor, or student who you think would be interested in this podcast, tell them to check it out. I'm so grateful for all of you, and I hope you are staying happy and healthy. Until next time.